Hi guys, um, welcome back to book club. I am so excited to be able to resume book club um, and very grateful for the people I've had on the past couple of weeks who um, it's my honor to be able to amplify these voices that are so important to be listening to and following right now. Um, so this week we read Between the World and Me uh, by Ta-Nehisi Coates. And it was my first time reading it. Um, I don't know if you guys have read it before, but somebody had recommended it to me and I've been taking the past couple of weeks to um, beyond, you know, going out and protesting. It's also very important to be educating yourself on these topics. So uh, reading this book really affected me and changed my perspective and I hope it did the same for you guys. So I'm also going to be bringing on Lexi, who I'm so excited to have on. Um, I first heard Lexi speak at Justice Hall, which if you guys aren't showing up on Wednesdays, you should be. Um, and she just gave such an empowering speech that I really took home with me. Um, so, you know, when I was thinking of who I wanted to have on, I really wanted the opportunity to be able to talk to Lexi and also to give you guys the opportunity to hear what she has to say because she definitely has a very powerful voice. Um, now, that being said, I definitely want to remind everyone this is an invitation to listen deeply to what Lexi has to say, um, practicing our ability to, one, understand our privilege. I know that I'm privileged, so it's really an honor to be able to continue to educate and grow and change, and that starts with recognizing your privilege. Um, so first, I want to give kind of some information about the book. Now, the release of the book was originally moved up to follow the white supremacy attacks in Charleston in 2015. Um, Toni Morrison, shout out Toni Morrison, you guys should all be reading Toni Morrison too, uh, has called this required reading and suggested it actually changes the conversation about race in America. Um, so this book is actually an explicit James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. It's um, another short book published in 1963 that begins with an essay titled My Dungeon Shook, Letter to My Nephew on the 100th Anniversary of the Emancipation. Um, a quick synopsis of the book. I hope you all read it, but I just want to kind of go over it and sort of explain. It's a six chapter letter from Coates to his 15 year old son, Samori. Um, but really beyond that, it is a memoir as well as a commentary about race. Um, and it was inspired by his son's heartbroken reaction to the announcement that no charges were going to be brought against Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson in the killing of Michael Brown, who was a teenager as well. Um, and that is what inspired this book to be written. So. Um, Without further ado, I really would love to bring on Lexi and kind of have her take it from here. So let's bring her on. Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for coming on. I know you're so busy. You were just on a panel and... Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Aww. Um, so do you want to give a brief introduction of kind of who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, well, my name is Lexi. Um, I'm currently on a show on Hulu called Little Fires Everywhere. I play Pearl Warren. It's an adaptation of a bestseller back in um, 2017 written by Celeste Ng. Um, I'm originally from Washington, D.C. I moved out to L.A. about six years ago. Um, activism and just honestly everything involving like politics and everything has just kind of always been something that I've been taught um, to pay attention to growing up. I've always been taught to know about black history, been taught to know about just things happening also on my local level um, with my community, like community politics. And so now with everything happening in the world right now, and then just recently given, you know, the platform on social media, I wanted to make sure that I was using my platform and my voice to amplify these things that I'm incredibly passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I hopefully I've been doing on my Instagram. A wonderful job at that, by the way. Thank you. So, um, so you actually, I didn't know you grew up in Washington. So that's actually where Howard is, which is where Tanahasi went. 
Mm -hmm. um, were you kind of familiar with the Mecca growing up? Because it was my the first time I'd heard of that sort of the Mecca and everything around that. Yeah, no, I was. Um, but I also yes and no, because I kind of moved um, to LA when I was about like 11 years old. Mm -hmm. I um, so I was always kind of on the younger side. I would visit Howard. I used to go to summer camp at Howard. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, that's amazing. Right down from Howard. So I was kind of um, educated on the Mecca, but reading the book really just kind of give, gave me more further information on it. Absolutely. Um, so I thought I kind of pulled some quotes that I liked, and then they kind of lead into questions that I would love your answers on, if that's cool with you. Um, great. So the first quote that I pulled was, Fear ruled everything around me, and I knew, as all Black people do, that this fear was connected to the dream out there, to the unworried boys, to pie and pot roast, to the white fences and green lawns nightly beamed into our television sets. Um, and ta talks a lot about the fear that accompanied his upbringing as a Black person. Um, what systems are still in place today that you feel create those experiences for Black people? Um, to me... I think, real, well, in my opinion, it's just like the whole system. The system yeah. uh, really was never designed to protect us. And growing up, a lot of times we were always taught that um, the bad guys went to prison and that the good guys were cops and they were supposed to protect and serve us and that everyone was equal. That's how, you know, they always kind of told us, you know, what this world or what this um I don't know what we live in right now and also just kind of like talking about like the full American dream and that, you know, we've always kind of learned that America is supposed to be like the safest place in the world and it's the best mm -hmm. place to live. Um, but that's so not the case. And so we are talking about systems that aren't designed to protect us. You know, the whole um, just police officers, they started off as slave catchers. Um, and so this system that we grew up thinking these people that we grew up thinking were supposed to de um, were designed um, to protect us and um, you know always be there for us was never really designed to do that. They were actually the ones that were catching our ancestors and that were um, beating our ancestors. And so um, to paint this picture within our school system or growing up that you know we were always supposed to look to police officers or look to to prisons you know to lock up all the bad guys when really there are I just can't even the countless thousands of black men and women that are in prison right now, um, just basically, you know, for marijuana charges. And that's just so not okay. And also the school system, um, the school system is just absolutely corrupt. Growing up, when we read our history books, we're always taught that America um, is this incredible place and that um, all these people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, all these quote-unquote idols were phenomenal people, um, but they weren't. They were slave owners. Twelve presidents were slave owners, and that's what they don't teach us um, growing up. They don't teach us who actually built this country. They don't teach us what this country was built on. And so these systems, um, in my opinion, I don't think that we'll really come to um, a proper conclusion or a proper um, call to action until these systems are completely destroyed and re because these systems have been going on for years and years, and these are the same systems that were enslaving our people. Absolutely. That actually leads perfectly. The next quote I pulled actually is he, ta says, the police departments of your country have been endowed with the authority to destroy your body. It does not matter if the destruction is the result of an unfortunate overreaction. And, you know, as a white person, and I think as, you know, a lot of people were raised, um, to believe that everything belonged to us and that systems like the police benefited me and everyone around me. And these were beliefs that I was raised on. Um, and ta talked about growing up feeling like he had to be twice as good to make it because he was Black. Um, did you have a similar experience growing up? You know, what needs to happen so that this no longer is the case for people who are experiencing oppression? Yeah. Um I still experience that now. Um, I've always been taught since I was younger was that I have to show up and be twice as good as my white counterparts. Um, and while yes, you know, things have changed in 2020 when you show up on set, uh, you know, everything is all good, but just I know as um, a young black actor in this industry that there are certain things that I can't do um, as my white cast members or my white counterparts. Um, I always have to make sure 
that I'm showing up fully prepared. I have to make sure that I know everything, all my lines, not just my lines, but everything that's happening in a scene um, so that nobody even has the opportunity or the chance to say that I wasn't fully prepared, that I didn't come to set knowing um, what I had to know and able to do my job correctly. Um, but that's just, I think that that's, that's been this thing for young black kids, especially growing up. There were always, you know, forever lacking. It always immediately goes to we're stupid or, you know, we are not educated or we aren't talented or, you know, we're lazy. Um, and th all those things are just, that's just the reality of what it's like to be young black in America. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, like I said, until these systems are changed, until we completely dismantle these systems that were designed um, to be against us, there will be no further change. Right. And um, he says, here is what I would like for you to know. In America, it is traditional to destroy the black body. It is heritage. Like you said, these are, you know, this is nothing new. This has been going on for as long as we can remember. And the lack of education that they give us about these topics in school, you know, is so surprising to me. And um, this book, it's a personal letter to his son. But given that, you know, he appears to say the black body, often referring to the black male body because he is talking to his 15 year old son. Could you talk a little bit about what experiences may not have been covered in the book, you know, given its focus on black cis men specifically? Um. Well, I think the biggest thing, what I absolutely loved about the book was the fact, that, you know, we had this black man that was also talking about um, the erasure of black women from the mm -hmm. quality. Um, and so while that was you know, a major topic and I, I wish that we would have gone in depth a bit more um, mm -hmm. that because a lot of times, especially within our own community, there's so much stuff regarding um, Breonna Taylor right now when I see so many posts so especially so many um cis black men you know speaking up that they're writing um, for black women but it really starts within our own communities and within our own households so you can't necessarily you know say I want justice for Brianna or I I'm writing for black women I want to protect black women I love black women but then turn around and um disrespect them or turn around and not listen to them um or turn around for light-skinned women over dark-skinned women. Um, and so there's just so much that Black women have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's so much misogyny within our own community. Um, there's a Malcolm X quote that I absolutely uh, uh, love and adore. Um, and it's called, um, the least protected woman in America is a Black woman. Mm -hmm. um, the, the most disrespected person in America is a Black woman. And I think that that's only to right now because since the age of five, Black women are always deemed more or less ladylike and always you know, more over sexualized um there's so many rules that we constantly have have to follow on a day-to-day -day basis whether that's um you know you can't wear this or you can't wear your hair like that or you can't talk like this because then you'll be deemed as the angry black woman and there's so many issues within our own community that i don't think that we touch on before we take it to a global level um so i think that um that's probably the biggest thing that I wish was, you know, spoken about more in the book, just touching on the misogyny within our own community before we go and tackle um, the misogyny the Black women have to go on a day-to-day -day basis on a more global or national level. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that even says, you know, that's kind of touches on that idea of generalizations. <laughs> and ta says, the dream thrives on generalization on limiting the number of possible questions, on privileging immediate answers. The dream is the enemy of all art, courageous thinking, and honest writing. So he talks a lot about this idea of the dream. Um, in this uprising, we've actually seen a lot of people finally rejecting this idea of the dream that oppresses so many people. You know, it talks about the dream, but that really only accounts for a very specific group of people who are included in this dream. And, um, What's your vision, you know, if you have one for a new dream that protects everyone, that accounts for everyone? Um, well, I think my vision, my dream um, for a system that, you know, protects everyone. I think that, you know, when I'm older, my biggest hope for the future is that, you know, my kids, my grandkids won't have to deal with the same oppression that we have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think, like I 
like repeating myself, but I think it truly is about dismantling the system um, that was not designed to protect us. Um, and so I think that whether within our own school system, making sure that there are more diverse teachers, um, that we don't just have um, white teachers, that, you know, we're really discussing, not just discussing Malcolm X or Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks, because I think a lot of times within our history books, um, they portray the civil rights movement as kind of like, um, my friend said this, as kind of like a um, three-day marathon, where it's like right. Rosa Parks um, refused to get up from the bus. And Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech, and then day three, everything is over, everything is fixed, and that's just so not the case, and there's so many um, Black icons and Black idols that we have to look to, and just like when we're younger, we're taught to um, look up to white idols, I think that everyone can also have Black idols, I think that everyone can also have um, Latina and Latino um, idols, have Asian idols. And so I think that, in all honesty, we just have to come together, put our differences aside, and really tackle um, just the systematic oppression and the systematic racism the country was built on and able to go further and really tr truly live out the American dream. Right. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> um, you really, like, seriously, your voice is so important and so powerful and, like, giving especially young women, the opportunity to listen and learn from you. You're so inspiring. Like, I cannot thank you enough for being on here and for reading the book alongside me and, and for doing this. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you have more saving the world to do, so I'll let you go. But thank you for making the time to do this. Thank you, of course. Stay safe. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Bye. Oh, I mean... If that didn't inspire you guys and teach you guys something, then I don't know what would. But um, I, one thing I wanted to touch on before I leave is um, Ta-Nehisi talks a lot about, you know, this idea of people who think they're white. Now, that was something that I flagged when reading the book because it was my first time hearing that term. Um, and... I think it's because he consistently seeks to undermine the legitimacy of the racial social construct while, you know, also pointing out the real lived realities that racism creates. Um, Lexi talked a lot about that. And thank you guys for listening alongside me, um, for growing, for changing, for amplifying. Um, and we will be back next week with another amazing book. So thank you all so much. Um, don't stop fighting this fight. It is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Um, I'm doing my part every day. I think it's remember, it's, I'm trying to remember to wake up every day and remind myself, you know, what can I do today? How am I fighting today? And what am I doing to make a difference? Um, you know, people like Lexi, are a great example of that. So thank you, Lexi, for being on here, for sharing your incredible wisdom with all of us. And um, I hope you guys have a good Friday and continue putting in the good work.